um, uh, thank uh, thank you uh, very much for this nice introduction, uh, Professor Wang, and um, uh, it's a great pleasure to give uh, this uh, presentation. So let me uh, begin first by sharing, of course, um, must not be forgotten. And um, I, you can see my screen, right? Okay, so um, the initial mass function of stars. Um, as an introduction or prelude, I'd like to start as follows. Um, the IMF is a distribution function and it's defined in this way. So it's just the number, infinitesimal number of stars in this infinitesimal uh, mass interval. Um, um, customarily, it carries the symbol Xi and uh, here's a visual representation of what uh, this distribution function uh, would look like um, as we understand it today. So here we have the number of stars normalized to, for example, a, a volume um, per um, mass interval. So here down here we, on this axis we have the mass. This is 10 solar masses, uh, one solar mass. And uh, the distribution function looks about like this. So here we have a power law function. This is a log-log uh, representation. And uh, the, this particular form has the salpeter slope above 0.5 solar masses with a flattening below 0.5 solar masses, which is just uh, uh, over here. And um, the blue part uh, shows the rare massive stars. These stars would um, explode a supernova air. And uh, the red part uh, shows the very numerous, very faint M dwarf stars. There might be variation with metallicity, so it might get uh, change its shape depending on the metallicity, as indicated here, and density of the star-forming uh, gas cloud um, at the massive end as well as at the low mass end. So um, the IMF is one of the most important distribution functions in astrophysics, as is uh, generally. Um, um, acknowledged and it is important for the luminosity of a stellar system. Its mass locked up in long lived late type stars. The red stars of the previous plot, they um, live for Hubble time and many Hubble times. So they just lock up the mass once they form, return, don't return much back. Then, uh, of course, the IMF is important for, for calculating and understanding the rate of core collapse supernova per late type star light up star or the red ones in the previous plot and um, it's important for understanding the rate of merging white dwarf binaries which leads to, or can lead to supernova 1a explosion events per late type star uh, it's important for the rate of merging neutron star binaries per late type stars this is important for the r process which um, generates the elements which or some of the elements which we observe and um, it's important for the rate of merging black holes per late type star which of course is important for um, the gravitational wave um, observations these days and fundamentally it's important for understanding the energy and element input into the interstellar medium so this is just an overall um, um, <clears throat> recollection of why the IMF is important and uh, central research questions are um, First of all, how does one even constrain the shape of this distribution function? Because we cannot measure the masses of the stars on the sky, and so um, that is uh, an, not a trivial uh, problem. And then an even less trivial problem is, once we do constrain the shape of the IMF, then uh, does that shape vary um, with formation conditions of the stars? So was this distribution function similar to what we observe in the Milky Way today? at high redshift or not. And so it's, uh, is star formation a messy process? Is a question mark here because it looks messy. Um, so um, the outcome of star formation appears to be messy and very complicated. If we just look at pictures like this of galaxies, um, the individual star formation regions which are in these dark lanes seem to be quite um, unorganized, um, messy, uh, complicated. We zoom in on these individual star forming regions like uh, this uh, nearby cluster which is just formed or the Pleiades here. You can see it looks complicated. Um, the scales differ. This is about 
uh, 100 times more extended at the central core of this cluster than that particular cluster, which is only about a million years old. Um, and uh, pictures like this tell us that it's indeed very, it appears very complicated. So we have a expanded region of young stars, a more compact one. There's an overall field population. There's some sort of cluster over here, which might be intermediate age. And then there's some cluster like this. And so, um, and the pictures like this look even uh, more complicated, right? So um, it looks messy and very complicated. Therefore, it is easy to argue that star formation is stochastic. Things just happen in, in a galaxy um, stochastically, randomly, more or less. Um, and that's what is often used today in computer simulations of galaxy formation is this um, simple um, ansatz to say that star formation is stochastic. But the challenge um, of the researcher is to find whether there are patterns and rules in this apparent uh, mess. Um, and one such effort to constrain is, the con is uh, to constrain the shape of the initial distribution function of stellar masses, the IMF. So the IMF is a distribution function. It could, in principle, be changing randomly, right? So you look at one region, it could have some sort of shape. Look at another region, it could have another shape. And this fluctuation could be just random, um, but um, the question is, is it uh, fluctuating wildly or is there a distribution function which does not vary? Or if it varies, is there systematic variation with physical conditions? And this has, of course, profound implications for our understanding of the very high redshift universe, as well as understanding how uh, galaxies and star clusters evolve. Now, related to these questions is the, um, um, the, the, the uh, interesting question whether um, the IMF is a probability density distribution function, which would follow from the stochastic idea. So uh, when star formation happens, um, there is a distribution function, but the stars which form is a stochastic uh, event. So a star forms, another star forms, and one randomly, mathematically, one randomly takes the stars from this distribution function or not. So there is another way of sampling the distribution function, which we refer to as the optimal, uh, optimally sampling a distribution function, which means that there is, there's no randomness whatsoever. So if you make a star cluster with n stars, According to this, there is no Poisson uncertainty. So this here is full Poisson uncertainty per mass bin. Here there is zero Poisson uncertainty. Okay, so these two extremes we can formulate mathematically. And the question is, what does nature do? Is it closer to actually being optimal? And that's related to self-regulated star formation. Uh, either the process starts and then you always get for the same physical conditions, always the same outcome without any Poisson uncertainty, or is it an actually random uh, process? Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, there was some very, very beautiful work done by uh, Jan, who's now a Zhikang Jan. Apologies for my mispronunciation. Um, and Therese Rabkova. Jan is now in Nanjing. And so um, finding the shape of the IMF um, is as follows. We cannot measure the masses of the stars. We have to go through the luminosities of the individual stars. So we measure the luminosity of the star. From that, we have to infer the mass. So we have to consider the distribution of stars with luminosity. And that's this distribution function. This is called the luminosity function of stars. And it has this, again, this definition. This is the infinitesimal number of stars in this luminosity interval where um, this is the absolute visual magnitude. Um, now, that's the astronomical way of measuring luminosities, uh, which makes it uh, intuitively a bit difficult to, to, to sort of uh, follow through, but this is just the luminosity. So this is what we get from the sky by counting, and this is what we want to have, and that's the number of stars with mass in this interval. These two distribution functions are, of course, related according to the following. So by using the chain rule, we can derive these, this, these, um, this differential equation, which leads to this function uh, uh, equation here. So you can see that um, we have the uh, luminosity function as defined up here, dn on dmv, that's this one down here. And then we have the uh, mass function as defined here, that's this, this part here. And then in between, we have this uh, function here. So this is what we want to obtain. This is what we can obtain from the sky by direct observation. 
um, and then this is an obstacle. This this function in between is just the um, the slope, the derivative of the stellar mass luminosity relation, and that's a serious problem. Now. Um, there are two ways of counting stars on the sky. The first is to look at stars nearby to the sun uh, by measuring the uh, absolute luminosity if we know the distance from trigonometric parallax. So the Earth goes around the sun. We can see how the stars are wobbling because the Earth is going around the sun. And from that, just by tr trigonometric uh, calculation, we can calculate the distance of the star uh, essentially directly. And this works only for a small region around the sun. Uh, and this gives us a, a luminosity function. So we count the stars per that volume, uh, which we can assess with trigonometric parallax. And that gives us this, um, the number of stars per S. They depend on the luminosity per unit volume. And then there's another way, um, independent of this one, which goes much deeper to distances of 100 to 300 parsec in pencil beam photographic or CCD surveys these days. So one looks at the sky with a telescope, takes images in different wave bands, V and I, and obtains the distances of the stars using photometric parallax, which means that we measure the color of the star if the star is on the main sequence, we can um, calculate the absolute the absolute luminosity it must have. Comparing that with the measured uh, magnitude or luminosity, we then get the distance of the star. And this is called the photometric parallax. Uh, and so this is the second way of uh, obtaining such samples of stars. The problem with this is that we have um, a large number of stars, but poor resolution because of the CCD and usually uh, because of the atmospheric um, um, scintillation and there are biases, for example, the Malmquist bias. At, up here we have small numbers of stars and um, the lutz kalka bias, uh, which is related to how the, uh, to, to trigonometric parallax measurements and here we have the Malmquist bias. I don't want to go into the details of this, but uh, there are biases which one can take into account um, correcting these counts. So. Um, we now have here um, the one way, but the first one is to measure the nearby trig trigonometric distance-based luminosity function, which gives us stars between 5 and 20 parsecs distance. We can use the Hipparchos or ground. Today there is the Gaia, which I haven't included here because it hasn't actually changed anything uh, significantly. Um, and this is Hipparchos is a pre precursor to Gaia uh, space mission to measure parallaxes of stars from space. And this is the result. So here we have the number of stars as a function of absolute visual magnitude. The sun has a visual magnitude around five. That's where the luminosity of the sun is. And what we see is that as we go to fainter stars from these bright stars, the numbers just increase. Then there's this plateau called the Wieland dip, and then it increases and seems to flatten out with increasing Poisson uncertainty, simply because the, the volume we can access these faint stars is smaller, so we have fewer stars at this faint end. Uh, so this is what we measure here using trigonometric distance measurements. Um, then we can do the pencil beam surveys going out to 100 to 300 parsec, which gives us this photometric uh, luminosity function. And uh, that looks um, as, well, yeah, before I mention how that looks like, now, uh, that, um, since if we go back to this plot here, you can see that the numbers of faint stars is increasing, and here we have large uncertainty. So it's unclear whether the numbers increase further or decrease or stay constant. These stars here are very, very faint. They have a luminosity a thousandth or less than uh, uh, that of the sun, so they are barely visible, which means you could fill a galaxy with these stars and you wouldn't even notice it. They could be a form of dark matter, essentially. And so in the um, early 1980s, um, it was considered that maybe um, these uh, faint dwarfs are a form of dark matter because one knew that the rotation curves of galaxies are flat. And so Bacal wrote a very influential paper suggesting that there is dark matter in the galactic disk, which could be these stars. And as a consequence of that, there were many such surveys of this uh, type, because you can do many pencil beam surveys. You can look at different directions and count the stars on the way, and so get a very large sample of stars and constrain the faint end of the luminosity function. So these are the s surveys which have been done, starting with the pioneering work of Neil Reed and Jerry Gilmore. Uh, 
um, and um, going on until fairly recently using the Hubble Space Telescope beyond the atmosphere, looking at different regions of the galaxy and counting the stars. And the result is um, as follows. So we have here again the number of stars versus luminosity. You can see here the sun is at five. So we are now looking at truly faint stars. And all these different um, uh, measurements have given always the same result as uh, shown here, a summary of all the ground-based measurements by myself and then the Hubble Space Telescope measurements by Gold et al. agree very beautifully. The number of stars increases to this peak and then it decreases with high significance. And so it seems that the faint stars cannot be dark matter in the disk. Now there is this peak and so uh, that peak of course translates from the luminosity function into the mass function if we assume that this is a constant or uh, maybe a very mildly changing function of the luminosity of the stars. And that's what uh, that has been done in the past by people like Milan Scarlo, Scarlo and others, which is why they derived a mass function which has a maximum around 0.3 solar masses where this is. Um, and so this is what we have. If we combine this with the uh, uh, star counts for the brighter stars, we have this increase, the maximum and then the decrease uh, based on these uh, photometric luminosity function. Now, um, if we compare these two samples, the trigonometric and the deep surveys, then we find that there is a problem. Uh, this is the trigonometric based one, and this is the deep photometry, photometric uh, sample. And that leads to question mark because this difference is significant. It looks like the sun is carrying around it within about five past six distance, a significant overdensity of very, very faint M dwarfs. And as you go deeper away from the sun, this number of dwarfs decreases um, per unit volume. And uh, that, of course, um, that's what the star counts tell us. But it is unphysical because the velocity dispersion of the stars in this volume is about 25 kilometers per second, which means every 10 million years the volume is exchanged by stars. The stars move through every 10 million years, and so it's impossible, impossible that such an overdensity is sustained around the sun. The sun cannot carry with itself a bubble of overdensity of M dwarfs because it's uh, not stable. It just mixes out and diffuses. And so what is the difference for this um, uh, for these star counts, because these are robust counts, except that here there are uncertainties, but this difference is significant. So what is the uh, uh, reason for this difference? At first sight, uh, this looks like an impossible task to uh, solve, because you're just counting stars and there's no understanding of this. And in such a situation, it has proven time and again in my own experience to um, keep such a problem in mind and attack the problem from a completely different point uh, aside, right? And that's what um, I did then um, in the um, early 1990s. Now, so we have this problem, the nearby and deep luminosity functions are not equal. And which one do we use to calculate the mass function here? Um, this function, this nearby one or the deep one, and that would, of course, lead to very different um, calculations of the mass function here. Now, I was mentioning this function here, which I have not yet addressed. And maybe that is a uh, attack point to solve this problem, although it's a bit difficult to understand how that could uh, um, um, have a bearing on the star counts. So um, let's look at star clusters. That's another attack point. We can look at completely different samples. Uh, of stars which formed together. So we were looking at the galactic field nearby to the sun. And let's look at star clusters which um, might shed light on this problem. So these are star clusters here. We can count the stars in the clusters, which has been done by the uh, seminal work of uh, De Marchi et al. So here we have a global cluster. That's the number of stars versus luminosity. And what we can see is these are all very faint stars. So the uh, typical mass is about 0.3 solar masses at this peak. The sun would be somewhere over here. And what we do see is that as we go to fainter stars, the numbers do increase in the star cluster and then it drops. There's a very pronounced maximum in the number of counts at this luminosity here uh, in the I band. And if you look at another global cluster, again, exactly the same behavior, very sharp peak of the star counts. There's a lot of stars at this luminosity, very few either side of that peak. <clears throat> 
And then we look at the Pleiades. These are old. This is a metal rich, young, 100 million years old cluster, exactly the same, very strong peak with a decay. And then another globular cluster again showing this very strong peak. And so this maximum is a robust result of star counts. It is there. And this would then suggest that if this has a maximum, then the mass function should have a strong maximum too. At least that would be the sort of interpretation what could uh, take from this. Now remember therefore also that the star counts in the galactic disk do suggest this peak, which is exactly like this peak. This luminosity is exactly the same luminosity as here, except that this is V band and this is I band here. Um, and then the nearby, the very nearby sample seems to indicate such a maximum, but it's the sign signif not statistically significant. And now it depends on what one uses, but this experiment here tells us that the luminosity function must have this peak. So how do we understand this uh, over the abundance of stars nearby to the sun? So first we understand, to understand the peak, we look into the stars. And there's a very beautiful uh, result here, and that is that um, we can look into the stars just by counting them, and that is actually the role of this peak. So um, this leads us now to trying to understand the mass luminosity relation of low mass stars. If we start here with the mass of the star, and this is the luminosity, so you can see the scale down here. The sun is at MV of 5, so this is the luminosity of the sun, that's the mass of the sun. So the sun is just up here. and um, if we now start at this very low mass, basically near the hydrogen burning mass limit, below which stars are brown dwarfs, they don't fuse hydrogen, up here they do. And if you now increase the mass of the star, we go to more massive stars, obviously the luminosity increases as we go to more and more massive stars. Um, but then, as we increase the mass of the star further, this gradient changes, it becomes steeper. Essentially, the, the change in mass corresponds to a smaller change in luminosity. The reason being that these stars are so cool that in the outer um, envelopes, they are um, forming the hydrogen molecule. But as we come to this mass of about point two, above 0.2 solar masses, the stars become warm, uh, sufficiently hot, the effective temperature is sufficiently uh, high, that this H2 molecule is broken up, it has a two, short lifetime, and that changes the, the mean molecular weight within the star, and it changes the internal structure of the star. These stars become fully con uh, develop a negative core, while these stars are fully convective. And it is at this mass range here, where the stars change from fully convective to a um, to a, uh, a structure which is which has a um, a, con uh, a, a trabeative um, core and a convective uh, outer region. And then as we go to more massive stars, um, the luminosity increases. Again, there's a bend, and that's due to the H, H minus ion playing an, a role of opacity becoming important in this regime and becoming less important for massive stars. Um, and that changes the slope, the slope in the mass luminosity relation. And so if we now look at the derivative of these functions, we get we see the plot down here. But let me first explain what the data are. So these individual points are observed binary stars where we have the masses precisely from the Kepler orbits. Now they are very well understood. It's known why these stars are above here. They are subdwarfs. They are just low metallicity stars. This is described in this uh, paper here, uh, in in this uh, paper which I wrote, and um, the um, uh, these curves are different theoretical models. So you can see here theoretical models of stars by uh, Baraf et al. and uh, Cis et al. Uh, and they agree they have this inflection point, uh, but not exactly the correct uh, position. If we do an, a calculation, we force the stellar model in the computer to not form this hydrogen molecule. We suppress hydrogen molecule formation by reducing the uh, dissociation energy. Uh, so in the calculation, the star can never form this hydrogen molecule. Then we get this line here. Okay, this inflection point disappears. And so if we now look at the derivative, so this here is the mass luminosity relation. And here, what we need is the derivative, the slope of this, and that's this function down here. So uh, this red curve is the um, derivative of this curve here, and that you can see has a maximum and a width which agrees with the luminosity function which I've shown you before. 
And all of these other models, which are these curves here, also have a peak and a width, but it doesn't exactly lie where the peak observed peak is. And that's simply because the stellar models are uncertain. The physics of understanding how the star changes, especially when it changes from being fully convective to having a radiative core is hellishly difficult. And if one does one dimensional calculations of the internal structure of stars, one cannot get it right because the stars are uh, magnetized, they have uh, rotation, differential rotation, and so they will always in reality deviate from the idealized one dimensional uh, models, right? So, but the important thing is that the width and the amplitude of the peak agree with this luminosity function here. And so we now fully understand why there is this peak in the luminosity function. It is simply an expression of the changing derivative of the mass luminosity rela relation as a, a result of the stars being fully convective at this low faint end and having a radiative interior with a convective shell on that side. So that's why it's so beautiful that just by counting the stars on the sky, we can actually look into the deep interiors and test stellar astrophysical uh, stellar astrophysics. And so therefore now we understand this uh, structure. This is a consequence of the changing interior structure of the stars. And this difference turns out to be, as we've shown in a paper in 1991, due to unresolved multiple stars. So here in the nearby sample, we can look at the individual stars and we can measure every single companion of these stars. And that's why this is a higher number count than here, where we do not resolve the multiples. Nearly every second star on the sky is a binary star carrying a faint companion. And that affects the counts in such a way that we get consistency for one single mass function here with both these star counts, taking into account this structure here in the mass luminosity relation and taking into account the fact that here we saw, see all the stars in the sample and here we only see the combined unresolved multiple system. And so the problem has been solved and we therefore do know the shape of the mass function from the star counts um, in, um, in the galactic field. So that's the shape of the mass function. Again, we have here the number of stars versus mass. Here we have one solar mass and here's now the low mass stars, 0.1 solar mass. And that's the shape derived from these star counts. So we see the Salpeter slope down to 0.5 solar masses and then a flattening below that. Um, and uh, this here is a representation of a star cluster with no binaries containing 125,000 stars and some models with fewer stars calculated by the seminal work by uh, Holger Baumgart and uh, June Makino in this paper. And they've shown how as the star cluster evolves, how the mass function changes. They've shown other things in that paper too, but this is particularly relevant here. So what happens is, at first of all, the, as the stars age in this cluster and the time proceeds, the massive stars evolve away, they die. And that's why uh, these stars disappear. And in a very old cluster, there are no stars below about 0.9 solar masses. That's a global cluster. So these stars have all died. Furthermore, at the faint end, you can see that the mass function is dropping down, and that is simply because the star cluster is evaporating its stars thermodynamically, essentially. So the energy equipartition process in the star cluster leads to the more massive stars segregating towards the inner region, and the low mass stars being pushed outwards. Uh, they absorb the kinetic energy since they are lighter, they end up having higher velocities in these stellar dynamical encounters. And as they absorb this kinetic energy, they are lost from the cluster and the cluster is therefore enriched with the more massive stars. And so the mass function evolves by uh, changing its shape and uh, the cluster loses preferentially its least massive stars. And that's just an, a consequence of the energy equipartition principle. And Long Wang, of course, is an expert exactly on this entire uh, topic. Um, and so if we now look at the massive stars, so the low mass star evolution is very well understood in star clusters. What about the massive stars? If you look at a starburst cluster like this one here in uh, the Large Magic Cloud, this is R136. 
there are two competing processes. The first is mass segregation. So the massive stars, if they form in this very young cluster, again, by the principle of energy equipartition, they sink to the center and form a core. And that can be estimated by the mass segregation time scale. Once they form in the core, and, and, and so this core formation goes very quick. For example, in the Orion Nebula cluster, it's something like uh, 100,000 years. So if the massive stars form in the cluster, within 100,000 years, they are at the center, forming a massive compact uh, a core of massive stars. Now that core is dynamically unstable and shoots out the massive stars. The core decays, a bit like an uh, atomic nucleus, by shooting out the massive stars on a, roughly the core crossing time scale, and that decay is very quick. It takes 10,000 to 100,000 years, which means that as the core is forming, the cluster is already shooting out the massive stars because the core formation is quick and then the shooting out is even faster. That's just the consequence of the strong the stellar dynamical encounters in the core. And Long Wang um, at your university has written a very nice paper on this uh, topic concerning the Orion Nebula cluster. So um, here's an image, here's a movie of this process. You can see this is a star cluster now with 30,000 stars and you can see the time here. Within less than a million years, the star cluster, which forms very compact as we observe them, um, shoots out stars and, and contaminates a region spanning 100 parsecs around it in, in less, than a hun, uh, less than a million years, in fact. And so within a few million years, you can see how expanded this whole young population looks like. An observer might deduce that these stars formed throughout the molecular cloud. In fact, they all come from the very compact cluster. You see, this is the scale in parsecs here. This cluster has a radius of 0.5 parsecs, which is actually quite uh, realistic, uh, and um, contaminates its um, ent entire surrounding molecular cloud by shooting out, in particular, the massive stars. You can see that these massive stars then propagate outwards and destroy the cloud as they move forward. We can track the individual um, uh, processes. For example, this has merged, this massive star has merged, and the, these codes of, uh, contain a stellar evolution. Uh, and the co color coding, I did mention that, corresponds to the mass. So the red stars are the low mass stars. Only stars above one solar mass are shown in this movie. But of course, the calculation contains stars down to 0.1 solar masses, but there are so many of those stars that they are not shown on this movie. And this was done by, by the work of Sung Kyung Or, who did a PhD um, uh, with me here in uh, uh, Bonn. So uh, the clusters depopulate themselves of low mass stars and high mass stars. In fact, if we now look at the loss from a cluster, so the loss per unit time, say, or the total loss, and this is the mass here, 0.1 solar masses, and this is the 150 solar masses, then the cluster, when it's born, it immediately shoots out its massive stars. It first loses its less massive stars. In fact, the most massive stars are shot out first, statistically, and then the less massive stars. And as this cluster ages, million year by million year, the less and less massive stars follow and are, are ejected. And then when the cluster evolves to great age, and all of these have gone and evolved, it evaporates its low mass stars through the energy equipartition process. Now, this function has never been quantified. Um, it must look like this, and this is just a sketch, but there's no, it has not actually been calculated uh, for different clusters explicitly. So stellar dynamical processes are extremely important uh, when determining the IMF shape. And um, as I was mentioning before, there's a very nice application to the Orion Nebula cluster by uh, Wangetal at your university. And uh, there's another application to the massive R136 starburst cluster by uh, Banire and myself uh, some time ago. So uh, we therefore have um, now the uh, consequence that we fairly well understand the mass distribution of stars, the IMF appears largely invariant in the Milky Way embedded star clusters. So wherever we look at star forming regions, this distribution function is largely the same as shown in this uh, review here. So all of these are different uh, young systems. For example, here we have the Taurus star forming clusters. Uh, in, in, the, in the Taurus clouds, these little embedded clusters. This is the Ra'ofuchi embedded cluster. Here we have um, um, the Orion Nebula cluster up here. 
Now, this is the number of stars versus mass. This is one solar mass, 0.1 solar mass. The hydrogen burning mass limit is just here. So these would be probably brown dwarfs. And uh, if you look at older uh, systems, open clusters, globular clusters, the shape is basically the same. Of course, these stars are not there anymore because they've evolved away. And so we understand the mass function quite well now. This is, again, the number of stars versus mass. Here are the M dwarfs. This is the hydrogen burning mass limit here. The sun is at this mass. And the, here we have the saltpeter slope from 0.5 solar masses up until a maximum mass. A salpeter massy slope with a value of 2.3 for the Paolo index up here. And down here we have this turnover or this flattening to a value of about 1.3. Um, and the Chabria uh, mass function is exactly the same, except that this little part here is approximated by a log normal form. So it's a more mathematically complicated version. Brown dwarfs are a separate population. There are these papers, which I cannot discuss here now, but the brown dwarfs form a separate disjoint population from the stars. So the stellar distribution turns over and decays. The brown dwarfs have their own mass distribution and planets have their own mass distribution. Now, um, there is a maximum mass of stars. What is that? That's an interesting problem and important to understand uh, also high redshift universe. There is actually now, as it turns out, a variation of the mass function through the most massive star embedded cluster mass relation. It can be visualized as follows. So we have here, again, the mass function, number of stars versus the mass. Here we have 0.5 solar masses, and this is a limit of, for example, 150 solar masses. If we start with a small cluster, like in, we observe in the Taurus Auriga star forming regions, these little clusters contains something like 10 to 20 stars only, and there are quite a few of them in, in this cloud. Then we have this mass distribution. It has, uh, um, con it has a shape which is consistent with the canonical invariant Paolo IMF, and it ends here. If we now look at a more massive cluster like the Orion Nebula cluster, it has again um, the same shape, and it ends at this most massive star. If you look at a starburst cluster like R136, it would end at this mass if there's a physical limit at 150 solar masses, it saturates, i.e. this doesn't continue to higher masses, but it stops at this mass. So this is at for, for little groups of 20 stars, for 1,000 stars, and 10 to the 5 stars. So from this simple argument, we might expect that the most massive star in an embedded cluster, which formed stars, depends on the mass of this embedded cluster. Is that actually borne out, or is this a purely stochastic process? Does this most mass, the largest mass, just stochastically depend on this or not? And it does not. So here we have the most massive uh, star versus the mass of this cluster. Taurus Auriga is down here. You see this is 10 solar masses. And the little embedded clusters in Taurus Auriga have a mass um, in this regime they have stars which do go barely beyond one solar mass. Uh, as we go up in the mass, up to 100,000 solar masses, which is where R136 is, we see a saturation. There are stars which do not appear larger than 150 solar masses. And then there are all these other in-between clusters, which um, where the mass of the most massive star correlates with the mass of the cluster, and this dispersion is consistent with no intrinsic dispersion because of the uncertainties. So this dispersion in the data points looks like the, uh, there is a single function which defines these data because the dispersion can be understood by the me measurement uncertainties alone. There's no evidence for an intrinsic dispersion in this function. And so this turnover looks like, it looks like there's a physical limit to stars of about 150 solar masses. And uh, this, this dispersion is not a stochastic, static, stochastic dispersion. It can actually be excluded with high significance. That means as the stars form in a better cluster, the, the formation process seems to be um, that of a self-regulated growth. The stars form, and the most massive star which forms in that cluster, probably through its feedback energy, stops the process of further growth. And that's why as the cluster forms, and depending on the amount of matter falling into this embedded cluster, it will stop at some point because the most massive star truncates the formation uh, through its feedback. That's basically the physical interpretation of this relation. Now, this 
relation implies that the number of massive stars divided by the number of low mass stars varies because of the shifting most massive star uh, mass. So with increasing mass, the stellar systems become increasingly top heavy. Now, the thing is the shape doesn't, the shape of the IMF doesn't change, but we are getting more and more massive stars in more massive embedded clusters. And this um, has very major implications for galaxies. This fact alone has really very major implications for understanding galaxies. And there's again, this very nice paper by uh, Jan et al, um, who's nicely shown this just as one example. So this is the most massive star that can form in an entire galaxy. If we assume that all the um, star formation in a galaxy happens in star clusters, in embedded clusters, and this is the fun it's a function of the star formation rate of a galaxy uh, so m galaxies with a high star formation rate like our milky way is making stars right up to the most massive star but the galaxies which have a very low star formation rate are making stars at most up to a, a small mass and this leads to the to the uh, consequence that these galaxies with a low star formation rate actually have dark star formation in principle you can see a galaxy which has stars in it seen from diffuse light but one would not be able to measure uh, star formation in it if one uses h alpha uh, um, observations and so the, the now uh, the sh it, fairly recently since about 2010 um, there has now become evidence um, that the imf does vary the shape does actually change and this has even more profound implications for cosmology and understanding the high redshift universe. So if you look at a starburst cluster like this one here in um, uh, the large magnetic clouds, uh, which has a mass of about 100,000 uh, stars, um, and one corrects for all the stars which have been shot out of the cluster, as I've shown you in the movie before, we can statistically for this age add back all the stars which were shot out of the cluster back into the cluster through doing these n-body simulations and it turns out that this star this cluster had a top heavy imf by getting back all these stars which were shot out of the cluster so that is uh, one of the first evidence for a imf which actually becomes top heavy then this is uh, um, um, confirmed later um, by Schneider et al for the entire Theridoridus region. This is a low metallicity star forming region, which is top heavy. This has too many massive stars. This is then confirmed by this uh, seminal work by uh, Zhang et al uh, in uh, fairly high redshift starbursts, which again show that they need a top heavy IMF to explain their uh, isotopologue uh, uh, ratios. And this is again a research group uh, now in Nanjing uh, studying these type of issues. And uh, then ultraviolet spectroscopy of nearby starburst regions just very recently confirmed this again, that they are dominated by massive stars. And furthermore, uh, there is a um, Maginic, Maginic Bridge cluster with this name published by these people recently. It's a metal pool cluster, which also itself is fairly massive and has a top heavy IMF. And the global clusters in the Andromeda galaxy uh, have been shown to have been uh, uh, top heavy at lower metallicity uh, by these researchers from uh, Zanjan in Iran. And um, so um, what we now know from observations, we can now try to infer the actual systematic variation of the IMF by the following argument, which I think is actually very uh, beautiful. So first of all, um, there is a deficit of low mass stars which increases with decreasing concentration in global clusters and that disagrees with dynamical evolution. There was a seminal paper, uh, I must say this is one of those research papers when I saw it, it was first announced in a, in a conference. Um, I immediately knew that this has the greatest consequences by Guido De Marci et al, the Italian group here. And what they measured is something which is simply not expected from theory. They measured the slope of the mass function in a number of global clusters, each point is a global cluster, as a function of the concentration of the global cluster. And what they found is essentially insane. They found that high concentration clusters at this end lack low mass stars. Yeah. And that's, of course, uh, not acceptable theoretically, because um, it should be exactly the opposite. This is what we expect. The um, 
the uh, sorry the low concentration clusters lock, lack loma stars so the high concentration clusters should lack loma stars while we observe the high concentration clusters to be full of loma stars and the low concentration clusters to lack loma stars why can that, that not be the case because if you take a global cluster and it's and you evolve it in a computer it evaporates its loma stars as i've shown before because of energy equipartition and and at the same time, because of energy equipartition, its core tends to shrink and it becomes a high concentration cluster. So evaporation and loss of loma stars go together with increasing concentration. That's this expectation. What these people have observed is something completely different. And how can one understand these observations in view of the uh, well understood theory? There's nothing on the theory you can actually uh, change to uh, change this expectation. And this is a, a very beautiful, allows a very beautiful argument to actually extract how the IMF varies. Let me explain it. So, first of all, when global clusters form, they're formed as extreme starbursts. You have to imagine you've got a million solar masses, probably 10 or even 100 million solar masses which formed in one single event in a parsec or so. So assume there was gas expulsion. The amount of energy by the stars which uh, is created in this burst is immense, and those stars would have pushed out the gas. If the cluster forms mass segregated, we can get a handle on the IMF when the cluster is formed. So here's an, a, a movie made by Holger Baumgart. This is red because this global cluster is embedded in gas. You can see now when the gas is expelled thermally, so with 10 kilometers per second, the whole cluster explodes. However, a small fraction of the cluster recollapses and forms a long-lived remnant. This is the global cluster we see today, and it would have lost all these stars if this picture is correct through gas expulsion. So the idea is that we have a global cluster which is not mass segregated and a global cluster which is mass segregated. These two possibilities. And what then happens when the gas is expelled here, we lose stars of all masses. The whole IMF is depopulated and shrinks down, while here we lose mostly the low mass stars which are at the outer regions. And so in that case, the IMF changes shape. It loses low mass stars and the massive stars are kept in the cluster during gas expulsion. This means this stellar loss is independent of mass, and here we lose mostly the low mass stars. And that's the handle how we can at, how we can uh, constrain the mass function uh, of uh, stars. So we had this statement that the observations disagree with dynamical evolution, and we can actually solve that problem by saying that the clusters formed compact, mass segregated, and the massive stars explosively removed the gas. The, uh, the loma stars were lost, and we end up with a diffuse, low concentration cluster lacking loma stars. And uh, independent of that, we look at ultra compact dwarf galaxies, which are like globular clusters, but 10 to 100 times more massive. And it's been observed that they have high mass to light ratios. They seem to have dark matter, but that can, cannot be the exotic dark matter. And if we interpret this uh, in this work by Dublinghausen et al. as being due to stellar remnants, we can calculate how many dead stars we have to put into these clusters, neutron stars and black holes, to give these high mass to light ratios. And that gives us another handle on how the IMF changes in extreme conditions. Furthermore, these ultra compact dwarf galaxies have a large fraction of X ray sources. And again, this indicates that they might have a lot of neutron stars and black holes. And uh, that again gives us a handle on what the IMF looked like when they were formed. And um, this implies therefore that we now have a fairly good understanding of the IMF changes. So we have a number of stars versus mass, again, the brown dwarfs. And as the density increases from these arguments, we get a more top heavy IMF. Now, the beauty of this is that all of these three arguments use different data and different methods, and they lead to the same result a functional dependence of how the IMF de uh, depends on metallicity and density. And so uh, we now have um, a formulation of the IMF as a function of the metallicity and star formation rate density. And uh, this is the IMF on a parsec scale, one million year time uh, formation time scale, i.e. in an embedded cluster.
And so there's this formulation we have the functions, how the indices change with uh, metallicity and density in these papers. And here is the newest, most up to date formulation in this uh, very nice research paper here by uh, Jan et al. And so this leads to the formulation that we have the canonical IMF in the Milky Way disk. And then in extreme environments, we now know how this IMF changes. At least we have a fairly good idea how the IMF changes its shape according to density and metallicity. And so with this knowledge, and I'm now nearly finished, um, we can construct entire galaxies, which is important for the high redshift universe. So you look at galaxies, look at how incredibly thin these disks are, it's in, in, in incredible. Uh, so in, in these galaxies, stars form in embedded clusters exclusively and so the embedded star clusters are the fundamental building block blocks of galaxies and this allows us a computational uh, handle on how to calculate the imf of a whole galaxy the galaxy wide imf what we do is we say that stars form in a clustered mode they form in embedded star clusters as is observed in nearby clouds uh, and the integrated galactic initial mass function then follows just by saying that we sum up all the IMFs in all the little clusters. So the IG IMF, the IMF of the whole galaxy, is just the sum of all the star formation events. That's a trivial statement, but mathematically incredibly interesting and very powerful. So this is the IGMF theory, which was formulated uh, by, by myself and student Carsten Biden at that time, 2003. And so we have an integral, we integrate over the whole galaxy. And if one does this and investigates properties of galaxies, a whole number of galactic astrophysics problem just dissolve into nothing. They're just uh, uh, solved immediately. For example, we have a natural explanation of the mass metallicity ratio of galaxies of the radial H alpha cutoff versus UV extended disk. So if you look at this galaxy, the UV light extends to larger radii, while the H alpha light goes to smaller radii. And this is fully understood in this framework as a consequence of star, star formation happening in embedded clusters. And many other problems um, disappear, uh, which have not been so far solved in extragalactic astrophysics. And so this is my uh, now um, last slide. We can now calculate the galaxy-wide IMF using the IGMF theory. And this plot shows the slope of the mass function as a function of star formation rate uh, at, the, um, um, at, uh, at the high mass end. And uh, this is the Salpeter slope at 2.3 here. This is what we see in the solar neighborhood largely. Um, and you see, for example, these blue symbols are from the observation survey by Gunavartana et al, who probed this galaxies with high star formation rates, measuring the slope of the mass function using H alpha and broad band photometry. And they indicated, they found, this is a very, very important paper, that um, the galaxies with the high star formation rates have top heavy IMFs, while those with normal star formations like Amal Kuwait have IMS, which are quite normal in that sense of being canonical. And then these green points here are from the uh, research paper by Li et al. in 2009, where they measured the, uh, the slope of the mass function for galaxies with very low star formation rates. And they found that the galaxies were lacking massive stars. They were top light. Now, these curves here are, are consequences of the IGIMF theory. So just take, taking the IGMF theory, calculating what the IMF should look like at these star formation rates, and these are the curves for different mass ranges. Because the, the IGMF changes its shape, it's a curved function, it doesn't have a single power anymore. Each of these curves here is for a different mass range. But you can see that the IGMF theory accounts for the observations exceedingly well without twiddling parameters in order to adjust these, uh, to, in order to match these data. This match is a natural consequence of just calculating galaxies by assuming stars form in star clusters. Okay, and so the, the, this is here uh, the work by Li et al. Star forming dwarf galaxies have top light galaxy wide IMFs. By uh, Gunavartana et al. Star forming massive galaxies have top heavy IMFs. 
And, and this is now a sign of respect from my uh, side that Francesca Matucci already in 1994 deduced exactly that. And for, for many, many years, I've been always neglecting this work. I've been saying this cannot be the case because I was quite convinced the IMF does not vary. But it was Francesca Matucci who had already understood very early on that exactly that must be happening um, in order to understand the chemical properties uh, of uh, elliptical galaxies. And so um, we have that the varying galaxy-wide IMF um, is, uh, very, has very significant implications for the astrophys astrophysics of galaxies and for the high redshift universe, uh, quite obviously. Um, the IGMF theory makes this computable. We can actually calculate a galaxy at a very high redshift, which has very nice implications. And these are my conclusions. Uh, what I covered is up here. And down here, I did not cover in this talk. And uh, the implications for the very high redshift universe are concerning quasars. There's a nice paper by uh, Teresa Irabkova on this. And um, also, in fact, we can understand the formation of supermassive black holes very nicely within this uh, framework. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, so, any question from the audience here? Or oh, if the speaker, oh, I see someone raising the hand. There are too many audience. Let me. Uh, so, uh, Professor Li Chen, uh, you can ask a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pamela, uh, thank you very much for the talk. I've learned quite a lot. So I'm working on uh, galaxies. So I'm very interested to know the galaxy-wide IMF variation. So as you uh, must know that, uh, you know, uh, actually just after the uh, annual review paper uh, by uh, Bastian in 2010, there have been uh, quite a lot in uh, progress thanks to the integral field uh, spectroscopic service like uh, Sauron, uh, Atlas 3D, uh, and, and ongoing uh, manga. So people have been using uh, 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 varied uh, methods. For example, the, the stellar dynamics compared with stellar population synthesis model, and also some absorption lines which are sensitive to the IMF variation, and uh, uh, as well as stellar population synthesis with different IMF models. So I think, well, now uh, uh, quite well agreeing that the IMF slope change this function for uh, stellar metallicity. So very well consistent with what you are, are talking about. So, and, and so uh, you have been, uh, 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 you know, so uh, if I understand correctly, you are more, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, so the star formation uh, rate density is a kind of driving parameter in your uh, galaxy wide and variation. So uh, how, how, uh, so, so uh, how can we understand you know, the relationship between the results from your uh, theory with you know, the observation results from the field service. So I'm, I'm, and uh, um, uh, for, for people like us, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we interpret in the, the observational data from FU and other uh, galaxy service, so how can we really assume IMF? So show it still use a universal MF, or we should really take into account the variation in future when modeling the galaxy data. Um, yes, so, yeah, I think it's um, always useful to use as a uh, um, benchmark an invariant IMF because uh, it's easier to understand uh, the, the results when one does modeling. Mm. Um, as, as a as a benchmark as something to compare with however it is uh, very very essential to apply this uh, variation of the imf to un to interpret the observations in addition to that and then the differences uh, in the two uh, modeling approaches will of course be uh, very useful for understanding what one is seeing um, no, yeah so so the the mangaras are so the the elliptical galaxies you're referring mostly to elliptical galaxies right so one sees that in elliptical galaxies the uh, the uh, the mass function appears to be bottom light right uh, at high metallicity largely and this is yeah it, just, it seems to be a fairly strong effect there are observational issues but i could maybe just quickly uh, mention 
this yes which is a consequence of the calculation of the igmf how an elliptical galaxy forms at very high redshift so what happens what you see here this is a slide taken from yarapkova in, in from this paper here so um first of all the galaxy starts to form with very low metallicity and um a very low star formation because star formation starts to pick up so the imf according to the igmf theory has this shape it's it's bottom light and top light that's what the IMF would look like in the first star formation, which just starts in the galaxy at very low metallicity and very low star formation rate. However, as the um, star formation rate picks up, the metallicity hasn't yet changed, but the star formation quickly increases as the ga gas is collapsing and forming more and more stars. One builds up a top heavy IMF very quickly uh, because of the low metallicity and increasing density. And this uh, top-heavy IMF now starts to increase the metallicity of the galaxy. And at the same time, at the, at the low mass end, now the IMF changes to more and more a bottom-heavy IMF because more and more low mass stars are forming in the more metal-rich uh, gas. So the gas can fragment more easily and form low mass stars, such that when one reaches um, the end phase with a very top-heavy IMF, so because of the high density and very high star formation rates, uh, the IMF becomes bottom heavy and top heavy. And so then uh, the IMF, uh, as the galaxy evolves um, to an ev again, a low star formation rate ends up being um, uh, bottom heavy. So I think the, 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 the you can see from this, these calculations that uh, the IMF, as the galaxy evolves, changes dramatically. And so whenever you look at the galaxy observation, you will see something different, right? Either it's something dominated by massive stars or something which is lacking massive stars. So that's the one thing I wanted to maybe uh, mention. How does the star formation, I'm not sure if you asked the question, how does the star formation rate density um, govern this whole uh, process or? Yes, exactly. I, I want to understand whether this process is the same, uh, the same process as what we have been thinking about. So in, in our side, we uh, assume that, uh, you know, uh, uh, gas with different metallicity actually have different cooling efficiency. So in uh, in metal poor environment, the gas uh, cannot uh, easily uh, segment. So you have to form more massive stars, right? Then if you have a, a higher metallicity, then the cooling efficiency is high, then you would end yeah. up with more uh, low mass stars, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct and that's what you see in this lower part here so we lack low mass stars yeah. exactly as you were saying essentially mm -hmm. but this doesn't come from theory this is empirically so we have this empirical function and it agrees with theory so that's the nice thing about it but the thing is when there's a very low star formation rate it's physically one cannot form massive stars even at very low metallicity because um, there's just not enough matter yet to form to get together into a st star, but this goes very quick, right? So the jump from here to there, I, I, I don't know how long it takes, but it's very, very quick. Must be something like mm -hmm. a few million years only. So uh, uh, realistically, one wouldn't really differentiate between this and that uh, in a uh, simulation mm -hmm. of galaxy formation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so if I, I, I have a little bit more time, then I would uh, say that uh, with Banga, we have been not only looking at uh, elliptical galaxies, but also star, uh, very strongly star forming galaxies, where we see uh, 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 emission lines, so very broad emission lines from uh, wolf red stars. So wolf red stars, so which are very uh, leaving massive stars. So right. using these massive stars to, uh, to constrain the high mass end slope for MF, we found exactly the same trend. So basically you have uh, uh, a, a top heavy uh, MF if, if the metallicity is low. And you, uh, that, that has been, have you published that, have you? Or? Yeah, 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 it's already published. Yeah. Where, where, yeah. Um, so the um, yes, apologize uh, for not uh, mentioning that in that list, um, I, uh, I'm, I definitely not complete. Um, I don't know if you can maybe send me the reference, please. Because sure, sure. Know, uh, yes, I'll uh, uh, send you an email. Okay. Yeah, please, yes. Because yeah. you know how this one doesn't isn't able to capture everything. And um, yeah. sure, sure. So this, I, th I think, this field has been uh, uh, you know uh, advancing very quickly in the past years yes. thanks yeah. to the uh, uh, IFU service. Yeah. Yes. So thank you again for the great talk. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll write to you definitely. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Hi, Pablo. This is uh, Nicola Napolitano. Um, I wanted to follow up on this uh, slide, actually. So uh, to ask uh, how much this is uh, consistent with the 
the super salpeter IMF that has just been observed in I right shift galaxy, for instance, from uh, Capillari, I don't remember who, that they make uh, these uh, dynamical models of the uh, uh, galaxy of the redshift uh, around one first. And the second uh, curiosity of what is in your opinion, uh, the, the better proxy for uh, uh, IMF uh, in general. So we, we know that there is a variation with uh, with different parameters. So it could be the velocity dispersion, it could be, uh, you show the, the self formation uh, rate or maybe uh, metallicity. So uh, what what is the, See the driving uh, parameters we can use as a proxy of the variation of the IMF galaxy. Yeah. Yes. So um, the uh, the first uh, question um, is um, related to the upper left here. Um, right. So we yeah. So so we get a top light IMF. I think the super salpeter, which be which be a slope which is steeper than this dash line, because this is salpeter. That's um, really extreme and might be difficult to get in any understood um, description unless we extend. I mean, what we can of what can, one can do in this framework is to say that in extremely high metallicity regimes, even beyond this value here, one would really uh, even make it more uh, bottom heavy. And then the inner regions of the elliptical are probably uh, very uh, metal rich, but then you have measurements of that. So. Um, uh, I think we are uh, uh, roughly consistent, but I'm not sure if we can reach the, uh, if this current formulation can reach the very, very uh, super salpeter uh, uh, values. And I think one must also take into account that there might be observational issues. So are the stars, the low mass stars, which one sees in the inner regions of these um, elliptical galaxies, the type of stars we see in the solar neighborhood, you know, I mean, they look like uh, M dwarfs, but you have to imagine that they've been there for a Hubble time in a very dense environment uh, with a lot of gas there too, which has been uh, a, a, a very dynamic environment. So there's been gas flows, very metal rich gas flows. Uh, and um, I'm not sure how that affects these stars because there would be uh, have to be accreting matter um, uh, just by being in dense gaseous regions, which is ionized gas, of course, but um, it can still be quite dense, right? Especially if something falls into this elliptical. And um, so, um, furthermore, there's an issue of helium abundance. I'm not sure, uh, because I think the inner regions of ellipticals would be very helium rich, uh, more so than current stellar evolution models actually uh, take into account. I've been discussing this with uh, Zhikang Yan um, in Nanjing um, in the past, uh, also with uh, Teresa Rapkova, and um, this is uh, a, a real issue because you'll uh, if we have this very top heavy IMF in the formation of the elliptical, it would have led to a very, very significant helium enrichment in the inner parts, well be beyond what we see uh, locally. And uh, and that, you know, how does, I, I personally actually don't, don't really know, but that would affect also the lower stars, which form from that very helium enriched gas. Maybe you know that uh, how the effect would be, I, I haven't yet, um, uh, seen any calculations um, and so I think there are still very open questions nevertheless the measurements which you refer to are are extremely important yeah because they obviously are the empirical constraints uh, on 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 what we have to understand so uh, I have another your... point. I know I, I mean this respect I mean uh, is more is a dynamical measurement right so I believe that most of the so since you're saying that it's very difficult to reconcile with the with solar population, kind of, then I, I suspect that here the problem is the, the assumption on the model. So they assume like a, a constant mass flat ratio. So that means that they are actually uh, probably overestimating the solar mass. And so this is why they have they need a, a super salpeter. While if you add some you know, more dark matter, if you want in the center, then you, you have to reduce the solar mass. So in, in, in this respect, you might want to, you, you could reconcile a little bit with, the, with some more normal subpeter, please, would it? Well, that, that, that is absolutely true. So um, uh, this type of formulation here, so this IGMF theory pr uh, leads to elliptical galaxies actually having um, a large fraction of their mass. I don't know if it's nearly um, even more than half, but it's definitely more than half the mass in stellar remnants, right? So the, the elliptical would be, uh, most of it actually might be stellar remnants. What we see is the stars, but it's full of neutron stars and black holes as a consequence of this top-heavy IMF. And that's then, from an observer, looks like dark matter. Uh, and that's been quantified in the paper by uh, Zhikang Yan, uh, uh, 2021. We can see how the mass-to-light ratio, so the dynamic mass-to-light ratio increases 
at the uh, as one goes to more and more massive elliptical galaxies. You, and the, you mentioned the proxy. So the proxy, let me just show this figure here, is this. It's it's star formation. It's not velocity dispersion. Velocity dispersion is is um, is just a consequence. So. Uh, basically, uh, what we have is that uh, at high star formation rates and elliptical galaxies, when they're forming, they had star formation rates going up to a thousand, even maybe ten thousand solar masses per year. So they would be even more to the right here. And what we plot here is the most massive cluster which forms in these galaxies. So this is actually now the luminous young cluster in this um, very nice work by Randria Manakoto at uh, um, 2013, and we looked at that before that. And so you can see that uh, as you go up, uh, you look at galaxies which have a very high star formation rate, and these are star forming galaxies studied by Randria Manakoto et al. One finds that the uh, most massive cluster increases with the star formation rate. Now that uh, is typically interpreted to be, um, again, stochastic, but it's not because the measurement uncertainties here are as large as the scatter. And this uh, again should hasn't been yet been published in, in these words, but it's quite obvious, especially from this work by Randria Manakoto et al, who've shown that these in their survey, uniform survey with the same machines and uh, analysis, shows that the scatter of these black points here. Are, is too small for random scat scatter. They exclude random scatter, which means that uh, I mentioned that in a star cluster, as it forms, the most massive star correlates with the mass of the cluster non-trivially. It's a physical correlation because of self-regulation. Now, the same seems to be the case on the galaxy scale. When a galaxy forms its stars, um, the most massive cluster is a physical consequence of the entire uh, physical properties of the galaxy, and it's not a stochastic process. Um, it's related to self-regulation uh, and the depth of the potential well, which can, which governs uh, um, the um, pressure in the gas, so the amount of uh, material you can, uh, the system can accumulate into a single cluster, right? And that's what we see nicely here. Uh, and uh, when we extrapolate this to the conditions in elliptical galaxies, when we end up with very massive clusters, uh, that, that then quite directly leads to the formation of supermassive black holes, without any exotic physics, I should add. So the, the velocity dispersion is a consequence of these, the, the way the galaxy formed and how it virilizes, and then the more massive galaxies, the higher velocity dispersion is more metal rich, has a more stellar remnants, um, but it's not the primary physical parameter in that picture. Yeah. Makes more sense, actually. Hi, Pavel. Hello. Hi, Pavel, it's here. Hello. Thank you for your beautiful talk. It is always a great joy to, to hear your talk. And uh, I would like to comment on, uh, thanks for mentioning helium things. Um, so we've discussed this before. Uh, just let you know that together with people in ENAF in Italy and the University of Tokyo, we are now having a survey of measuring stellar helium abundance. This will be a realistic constraint for the helium, in, uh, helium enriched yeah. Stellar models and the further for population synthesis for elliptical galaxies. Just to let you know. I think that will be good news. I, I so my we, we were discussing this in Bern with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so my, my question uh, is on uh, on the uh, kicking off massive star kicking off from the uh, stellar clusters. Uh, as we know, when the stellar cluster involve, uh, they pass the the clusters pass through the um, molecular clouds again and again. That will also change the uh, velocity of the star. So um, just a curiosity, how could this interaction between the interstellar median and the stars could change the picture of uh, massive star kicking off? Um, well, uh, yes, so it uh, depends on the ejection velocity of the massive star. If it goes out fast, um, then uh, it's a ballistic particle just leaves, uh, uh, ionizes the gas that it goes out uh, in the molecular cloud and barely feels the molecular cloud. It just leaves, right, and, and propagates to fairly large distance before it explodes or dies. Uh, massive stars which are uh, nudged out with a much smaller velocity of say a few kilometers per second they might end up orbiting the cloud or actually having a curved trajectory within the still existing cloud as it's being destroyed and that's an interesting problem um, to uh, look at now um, 
Uh, at the Max Planck Institute, there's a, a, a student here, um, Konstantin Grishunin, who's just held his thesis committee meeting, and he was, well, I would nearly say nearly complaining in a sense that the a total mess because the molecular cloud is much more fragmented than in the surrounding regions and uh, my interpretation of that is it's exactly that so uh, when you have a massive molecular cloud which starts to form these massive fairly massive star clusters these star clusters shoot out the massive stars uh, primarily and preferably initially and this flux of massive stars destroys the cloud but not in one go but in pieces and chunks right and so okay. um this, i think that's a very nice uh, consequence actually which i've just realized in fact it's only a week since i realized that uh, when you have such starbursts the massive stars as they are ejected they fragment the molecular clouds and they really make the whole region look very massive uh, messy and it, it then, of course, has implications for further star formation, how these clouds uh, or, uh, reassemble or, uh, or, or don't. Um, uh, it, it'll, it, it adds complexity, uh, but I think it's nicely. Uh, so, so the morphology of the 30 Dorado star forming region, I think, is quite nicely understandable as a consequence of the shooting out of massive stars. Now, there, there is an issue which uh, František Dinbir in Prague is uh, studying uh, and, it, and he's basically finished with that project, is that when you eject massive stars, um, they will, if depending on the velocity, have curved trajectories. And when one wants to follow them back to the origin, one will maybe make an error, right, because if the trajectory is curved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and this is related to this two-step ejection process, which we've discovered where you eject a massive star um, in a binary, one of the uh, companions explodes, and then this other massive star goes off in some other direction, and then you cannot trace it back to the um, origin cluster. In fact, it might even stand still. So the binary is ejected, one star explodes supernova, and the other star just stands there, just because the uh, velocity vectors compensate. Uh, which leads to exactly the number of supposedly isolated massive star formation, which some people claim proves that star formation is stochastic. That's just nonsense. What one actually sees is a certain fraction of stars through this two-step ejection process, and therefore you cannot re retrace them back to the original cluster, and that's what they claim to be um, uh, evidence for isolated massive star formation, which is just nonsense, because how can you physically create a single massive star out of uh, just one single little molecular cloud. I mean, that's just physically uh, will never work, you know. Thanks. Uh, nice to see you also again. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, Pavel. Uh, this is room function uh, in the Sun Yat-sen University. Uh, toward the end of your uh, talk, uh, you have shown a slide uh, showing the alpha three slope. Uh, uh, de dependence on star formation rates. Yeah, this one here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's sort of uh, suggesting uh, the impact of the star formation, the process of star formation on the shape of the IMF. So um, I wonder um, why didn't you use the uh, specific star formation rate for the x axis, because uh, you know, you know the data here are, I guess, is collected from a sample of galaxies, right? And those galaxies have different masses. Therefore, mm -hmm. the, the the kind of uh, the star formation rate can be uh, related to the total mass of the galaxy. So yeah. um, I wonder, you know, if you use a, star, a specific star formation rate, then you know what will be. Is there any like uh, clear, clear relation between the slope, the alpha three, and the, the specific star formation rate? Yeah. So um, this is a very interesting uh, line of thought. Um, it's related to the main sequence of galaxies, right? So. Um, we, we know that galaxies are on the main sequence, the vast majority of galaxies are on the main sequence. Um, since the vast majority, more than 90% of galaxies are uh, star forming disk galaxies with thin disks. And, um, and so um, the main sequence uh, is just a scaling essentially where uh, when one increases the mass of the star forming galaxy, then it has a higher star formation rate. And the scatter is quite small. That's why it's referred to as the main sequence. 
-hmm. And um, that main sequence itself is very interesting. Why does it even exist? Um, and it's redshift dependent, um, but the scatter and slope doesn't seem to change with redshift, which are all very interesting uh, implications. But if you then start to measure it by the mass of the galaxy, mm -hmm. in Right, but nearly horizontal. And um, uh, if one does the IGMF correction, so the fact that if you interpret the observed star formation rate in view of a top heavy IMF or, or bottom light IMF here, the, the observed star formation has to be corrected because the observed star formation rate is typically measured, say, with the H alpha luminosity, but typically it's a measure of the uh, light emitted by the massive stars. So assuming a canonical IMF. If, however, uh, per massive star, you the galaxy is forming fewer massive stars because we are at the top uh, at this end, and then the star formation rate is actually smaller than what uh, is thought, right? It's corrected for, and this then leads to the main sequence of galaxies becoming flatter nearly nearly horizontal it might even be completely horizontal and so in that sense uh, this has an important implications for the uh, specific star formation rate in the sense that maybe uh, this is an indication it's, it hasn't been shown yet uh, but the dependence of the specific star formation rate on the mass of the galaxy is nearly gone it nearly oh. doesn't exist yeah so it's basically a flat regime which has deep cosmological implications of course so so based on what you said um can i just understand this uh plot as being the relation between alpha 3 and the, the total mass of the galaxy yeah it, basically that's it yeah mm -hmm. okay okay yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's also true for ellipticals. When ellipticals formed, they were in this regime of star formation rate, and they had uh, very top-heavy IMFs. And, you know, Francesca Matucci already um, <laughs> discovered that a long time ago. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Since we have already a lot of discussion, so the gentry will have the last question, please. Hi, Paolo. Thank Hello. you so much for the very, very informative talk. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think the, the first um, I want to raise up is not a question, it's um, we, we are actually uh, continuous with the line of sardine isotopes in galaxies. And actually, at least the recent results seems like um, the low metallicity, low star formation with the dwarf galaxies should have a bottom light, oh, no, 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 top light IMF. So basically, no enough massive stars that is still more or less consistent with IGMF prediction. Oh, really? Um, okay. So um, I think it's not, uh, it does not belong to this plot, but another corner of the, uh, yeah. of the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically nearby uh, gas rich dwarf galaxies, uh, the isotope log ratio shows that they, they have no enough massive stars, at least in the past. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question here, probably um, they are quite naive. The first question is about the formation of globular clusters. Um, maybe from what you described, do we, can we expect that the, the original formation of globular clusters can be happening in, on a bit larger scales, then later on it will shrink to more compact size to parsec. But probably in the beginning it was like 10 or even 100 parsec scale. Um, yeah, that's uh, indeed an uh, important uh, uh, problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, I um, think one has both. Um, it's quite, uh, so I do think that these very compact starburst systems they do occur, uh, and that's um, and those would, would be the ones with uh, which would have formed with the top heavy IMF, mm -hmm. um, low metallicity, very high density, and yeah, uh, top heavy IMF. Um, uh, but one can assemble uh, systems of uh, the same mass just by merging a lot of smaller clusters, which is basically what you are saying. Um, so it's because you wouldn't have a hundred percent cloud with individual stars forming, you'd always form an embedded clusters. That's just yeah. You, you yeah. Know, there's always four molecular cloud cores, which always form more than one star, right? A few stars at least. 
And that can uh, lead to similar objects, which then have a different mass, dynamical mass to light ratio. They have, they would have a uh, potentially a top top light or even a normal uh, IMF, uh, like the system wide IMF, because you're adding all these low mass clusters, and and those systems indeed end up with um, uh, look like globular clusters when they uh, if they merge, uh, but would uh, have never had a top heavy IMF. So actually, I was thinking about, for example, 30 orders. The size is uh, probably larger than the very compact the mini uh, uh yeah. size. So I was expecting maybe in the future it may shrink to some very compact object like uh, global clusters. Yeah, no, maybe not. That 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 i think um uh, would be unlikely because it's too big and the tidal field uh, even though it's mm. the lmc uh, i don't think the whole thing is uh, able to to collapse uh, but okay. one would have to look at the velocity dispersion of the individual clusters in the whole 30 dorados region uh, line of sight velocity dispersion but it would be typically about 10 kilometers per second that's what we see in uh, molecular clouds and then it's i don't think it would be able to uh, collapse um no all right. Okay. Thank you. Moving apart. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, my final question is about uh, basically in general star formation. So as um, as we already know for quite many years, like all the local Ulux, the most extreme star burst galaxies, they are major mergers, and uh, it, galactic interaction uh, merging events will quite efficiently uh, like uh, enhance star formation and. It, probably induce starburst activities mm -hmm. so probably that tells us that star formation is not a stochastic uh, process i mean probably we cannot have a random molecular cloud it will form stars automatically we need some um, force from outside maybe gravity maybe some instability to help it to collapse and form uh, stars mm -hmm. So I want to know what's your opinion about like global uh, dynamics of galaxies to uh, regulate the IMF. Well, I mean, uh, uh, mergers are extreme events, and of course, when uh, when all the gases uh, collides and compresses, it cools catastrophically, um, and would have one then gets these starbursts, which would then end up being top heavy, and this would have a big implication of the feedback and metal enrichment. So that would be, in, be uh, dramatically important. Um, the question is, how often do these mergers happen, right? Uh, and so, you know, uh, what you're seeing um, are starbursting systems, but they need not necessarily be mergers. They can just be um, galaxies which are passing each other, uh, and uh, then they separate again. Uh, some might merge, uh, and, and of course, this is then related to the question um of the existence of dark matter um and uh, so if you have dark matter then there would be a lot of mergers uh if there is no dark matter then mergers would be quite rare actually uh, but they are still flybys and galaxies can uh, capture gas from other galaxies through tidal arms which then are, uh, gaseous tidal arms which are accreted which then can fuel a starburst in the galaxy which is accreting gas from the other galaxy um but but I think a burst star uh, so mergers um, from the way I understand the galaxy population mergers cannot be really important uh, because um, I mentioned this picture before um, the uh, galaxies are uh, just ridiculously thin right I mean um, mm -hmm. if you look at uh, this picture let me see if I can find it again. Um, um, I can't find it now, of course, typically, uh, but the, these uh, galactic disks are razor thin, right? I mean, yeah. is this one here? There, there you go. I mean, look at this. This is this actually has quite a strong halo, but but the thin, the, the, these disks are incredibly thin and huge. And if there were big, uh, if there were as many mergers as, uh, as, if, as nearly everybody says, you wouldn't get these thin disk galaxies. It's physically completely impossible. And we've shown that in a recent publication by Hasselbauer et al., where uh, the observed galaxies uh, are on in, in the whole population far too thin and too big and thin to have mergers being a significant uh, part of the evolution. Uh, any perturbation of such a thin structure distorts it and thickens it up. Right? So I think mergers are rare. And what you're seeing are maybe very rare events, which are very important, 
especially for the very uh, understanding the variation of the IMF, but um, there might also just be encounters, strong encounters of galaxies. So I would personally ask uh, the community of astronomers to not use the word merger. It's an over-interpretation of the, of the observations. Right? I agree. Interaction, uh, interaction. probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you. Me too. Thank you for our next talk and all the questions. So we... The uh, bottom is close to end, so thank you for following again.